Okay. Okay. Um, probably should yeah, sit on one side of the other. So anyway, uh, this is the review for the, for the midterm on Wednesday. And um, the main thing I'm going to go over are the review session problems. These are posted on my website. So if you don't really want to take a lot of notes, you don't really have to. Because I also have the answers to all of these problems on my website, too. So everything is actually already up there. Some people like to take notes anyway. Uh, it just helps them sometimes. So that's fine if you want to do that. Uh, but just enjoy it as much as you want. Um, if you have to leave early, that's fine. My goal is to try to be out of here by 9. You know, it shouldn't be that, that bad of a you know, material. We have to spend too much more than that. Question? You do have lots of time. And I have office hours right after. That's true. After the review, uh, if people want to follow up uh, or work on the homework or uh, ask more questions, uh, I will be down there uh, this evening. I've been gone for the last three days, but I'm here for the entire night tonight, pretty much. <laughs> so we'll we'll get you guys squared away. All right. So let me start by just uh, going over the breakdown for the test. Uh, as I think I already told you, uh, it's going to cover uh, so the midterm one is going to cover uh, chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. And in terms of breaking that down, um, I think a rough estimate might be to expect chapter one would be about 40% of the test. And, you know, a good way to kind of feel that part of it out would be to review the quiz, because we took a quiz on chapter one. Uh, and those first, about, about three group works were all just pertaining to chapter one. Uh, the main topics there are going to be the differential equations. So you need to know how to solve, you need, you need to know how to identify and solve equations that are separable, linear, Bernoulli, and homogeneous. Now, there was one time I gave a test where I asked a, a differential equation that was none of those, right? I could do that to you. I could give you something totally strange. If I did something totally strange, I would have to do one of two things for you, though. I would either have to give you a proposed solution, in other words, a trial solution, say, here's a solution to guess. You know how we would sometimes guess the uh, x to the r is a solution, find the values of r, or e to the rx is a solution, find the values of r. Uh, I could do that. The only other thing I could do is if I gave you a differential equation that was not one of the four types that we learned, um, there might be a different change of variables that would, again, convert that equation into, you know, a separable or linear one. But if I did that, I would have to tell you the change of variables to use. Right? I, don't, I would not expect you guys to dream up, you know, how to convert the differential equation into a nice form. That's not, that's not reasonable for me to expect that. So if, if anything, I would give you the change of variables. And then if I gave you the change of variables, I would expect you to be able to substitute everything in terms of the new variable, identify the new equation as something familiar, solve the new equation, and then convert it back. Just like we did for Bernoulli and homogeneous equations. Okay, so that sort of philosophy, I could, I could ask you to do that. Um, so the, and then in chapter one, the only other applications really are the Newton's law cooling and the mixing problems. We talked about those. I'm probably going to let you off the hook on the, the problems about where you throw the object into the air, you know, and you say, well, the kid shoots a rocket up and it's supposed to get to this maximum height and hit the ground at some later time. I don't think I'm going to go there. Uh, that's, that was really just by way of introduction. So you would recognize that you're always solving differential equations in the real world, but there's not really a lot of 250B really in that. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that go. You could take my word for it. I can ask you about that. Okay. It's on tape, right? You've got to have a record now uh, that I said that. Okay. Uh, chapter 2 might be about 35% uh, of the test. That was it. Well, um, except that um, the, the Newton's Law of Cooling was first introduced in that it section. Is one, one yeah, yeah, and I mean, actually, 
There were also examples of verifying that something is a solution to a differential equation. So I don't want to say that 1.1 is not relevant at all. I'm just saying I'm not going to. Because basically those, those Newton's law, uh, those um, gravitational force problems really are just uh, an exercise in translating a word problem into initial conditions and then solving for the, for the constants that come up. It's not really doing what I consider calculus, which is what differential equations are a part of. So, um, right? There's um, one problem that's verifying the reciprocal problem. Yeah, if it verified that something is a solution to a differential equation. So guys, I could give you any differential equation. It could be horrible. It could be something you've never seen before. It could be not any type you've ever looked at in your life, right? And as long as I don't make you come up with how to solve it, it might still be a reasonable question. Such so as maybe I give you the solution and I just say, verify it, right? That's like handing you the answer and then just asking you to check that it works. I could do that with any differential equation. We don't have to really know a lot of material to be able to do something like that, right? Or I could maybe not go quite that far. Maybe I don't hand you the full solution, but I could still uh, hand, hand you sort of a change of variables, in other words, a strategy for making the differential equation become simple enough that you can solve it on your own, right? You understand what I'm saying? So I could ask you something like that. Okay, in uh, chapter two, we're talking about systems of differential equations. Um, I expect everybody to be able to do EROs uh, to a, uh, basically you take a linear system, you put it into a matrix, you want to solve the system. Uh, there are either zero solutions, one solution, or infinitely many, depending on how the pivots end up in the row echelon form of the matrix, okay? Um, when you're taking the test, try to be careful with your EROs. I'm not going to take off a lot of points if you make a small minor ERO error, <coughs> but on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the other hand, if you make a, an error on the EROs, the problem is then your work becomes messy, right? And it, it's uh, nobody's fault when that happens. It's just unfortunate. So I'd rather not have it happen. So try to be careful. Try to choose your EROs wisely. I think people are getting better at it already. Remember the very first time we did homework problems where we were row reducing the matrices? Some people were doing so many steps, right? It's not really necessary to do that. And so hopefully you're getting a little more polished with it. Row reducing a matrix, that's really, that's really important. Um, so you can expect to see stuff about systems of equations in there. Um, certainly matrix algebra, um, knowing how to do things like add, subtract, multiply, scale and multiply, take a transpose, and in some cases, find an inverse. That's a more recent thing we've talked about. Inverses of matrices. Uh, they don't always exist, of course, right? It has to be a square matrix. has to have a non-zero determinant, as we learned later. So um, basically, the, the um, invertible matrices is a big, big topic, right? In fact, you should know the invertible matrix theorem. This, we've only done seven statements of it, and I don't think I ever pointed this out, but the invertible matrix theorem is actually in the back cover of the book. It was go right to the back cover. A through S in this uh, page on the left side. It's uh, something that is a work in progress. We're not done with it yet. We've only done up through the first uh, seven statements, I believe, A through G. Uh, but you should know those statements. And it should be more than just, yeah, I've memorized those statements. It should, what you really want to do to feel ready for this is you want to actually understand those statements. Like, how are they connected to each other? It's a very important idea. All right, so if a matrix has rank n, right, that's one way. So if you have an n by n matrix and the rank is n, that means there are n pivots going right down the main diagonal. And that means that you could use EROs to reduce that matrix to the identity matrix, which is another statement in that, in that list. So not just knowing the statements from memory, because that's just superficial knowledge, but actually understanding conceptually what an invertible matrix is and what it means when you have an invertible matrix. Um, think, of, think a bit about that kind of thing. The, the exam is not going to be 
ultra theoretical. Okay, that that's something I save for my upper division classes. But I probably will ask you something theoretical. This is not just going to be a mindless uh, plug and chug calculation exam. There, I, I will not ask you. I've decided I will not ask you true false questions. Um, if I do ask you true false questions, I will tell you whether it's true or whether it's false, and then ask you to explain it. Um, I, and I think on the sample test, I might not not have done that. Uh, so. The reason is that it just trips people up, right? It, those true false items, it, it just, um, it's a, they're a little unfair sometimes because they get really tricky. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean to do that to you. I don't mind doing it on a group work or on a homework, but probably not on the test. But I might ask you, oh, here's a statement that's true. Please explain why it's true. Or here's a statement that's false. Please give me an example to show me that it's false. Okay. So the rank of the matrix A plus B equals the rank of A plus the rank of B. That's a false statement. Give me an example. Okay, These stuff like that. And you can, you can see a few good examples of that if you go back to the group work. Okay. So I may ask you some questions like that. It's not, the exam is not going to be overwhelmed with those kinds of questions. But I might ask a, a few questions like that uh, to the point that it's probably to really feel totally ready for the test, you should you should think a little bit on the theoretical stuff that, that could come up. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. So um the stuff that you posted you uh, did kind of hard numbers that we think should we I did? Well I mean it, it didn't come out as yeah. I'm gonna okay. If they if it of course when I'm writing review questions, right? I don't have to be quite so careful yeah. because I know it's not the real test, and you know we have time and 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 whatnot. So um, my goal with the exam is I don't want I do not want the calculations to be the thing that that measures a student's knowledge. So um, I want to know do you know the methods? Can you think? about things and can you explain those things. So that's what I'm really going to be looking for and if the numbers come out relatively messy, I'm not saying I, that you couldn't see a factor of like a one-third or a one-ninth here or there, but you're not going to be seeing like, you know, 191 out of 266. Those sorts of fractions are not going to be in there. Okay. Yeah. I have not written the test yet, by the way. Uh, I always write my tests like literally at the last minute because I like to come to the review sessions and just say everything. I don't like to have to worry about, well, am I talking about something's on the test or not? I just talk freely about everything and then and then I write my test later. So I can't tell you for sure, but I'm going to make sure. I always I always solve my exams before I give them out. I already have the solution. The solutions will already be typed up so that I will know if there's a problem with the numbers. I can fix it before I give it to you guys. Okay, so don't worry about that part. Okay, uh, and then the last bit here is chapter three. I would say about 25%. These are just approximates. 25%, this is going to be uh, the determinant of a matrix. I would like you to know how to calculate the determinant. I may deliberately give you a four by four matrix or bigger so that you must use cofactor expansion. Right, with a 2x2 two two and a 3x3, three three, you can use the arrow method, which is really just a cheap memorization trick. And I don't mind you using it if the matrix is small, but uh, do, do be sure to know the cofactor expansion method. As well as the ERO process, because remember that if you row reduce a matrix, a square matrix, you can introduce a lot of zeros into that matrix, which then makes the expansion easier. So a combination of methods is often the most favorable, right? Row reduce the matrix to get some zeros in there. Maybe you don't row reduce it all the way, but row reduce it far enough that the matrix has a lot of zeros and then cofactor expand whatever row or column is seeing a lot of those, those zeros, right? That's kind of how you um, can most easily solve the problems. It means you need to know how the EROs affect the determinant, right? And while we're at it, we may as well say that in class last week, we talked about how the transpose affects the determinant and how taking an inverse of a matrix affects the determinant. Um, basically, I think it's properties P1 through P8 in, in section 3.2 talk about the effect of a variety of operations on a matrix 
how that affects the determinant, which is what you need to be able to do in chapter 3. Of course, the determinant being non-zero is a measure of invertibility. That's huge. That's really important. And we use the determinant to do what's called the adjoint method and Kramer's rule for um, systems of equations and finding inverses of matrices. So we did all those applications actually last time, and that pretty much wrapped up chapter three. So that's kind of where we're at. There's a bit in chapter three about um, permutations, I believe, in section 3.1. I don't know how many of you actually read that, because I always tell you, you don't have to read the stuff that I'm not talking about. So um, section 3.1 of the book um, is maybe, you can skim it, right? You don't even know the details. It does talk about the whole area and volume interpretation that we did last week, and that's a good thing to be familiar with. If I ask you, and by the way, I said I won't ask you true-false questions, but I can ask questions that are like true-false questions. Is this vector, right, uh, in the same plane with these other two vectors? Right? That's a yes-no question, okay, it's basically true-false. But that's not such a conceptual one. Remember how you decide that? Basically, if I give you these two vectors, and then I give you a third vector over here, and I say, is that vector in the plane of these two? What you do is you take those three vectors, and you form the parallel of hybrid that is generated by those three vectors. If that <laughs> parallel of hybrid has no volume, which is what the determinant tells you, then you know that the thing was basically smashed flat, and that means all the vectors are in the same plane. Okay, so you can use the determinant through the sort of backdoor method. Uh, it tells you the answer to that question. And that's purely computational. You just take the three vectors, throw them into the rows of a three by three matrix, take the determinant. If it's zero, then it means the parallel pivot had no volume and all the vectors are in the same plane. I think we did that last week, right? We took the vectors 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, 9. We took the determinant of that 3 by 3 matrix. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We got 0, right? That meant that there's no volume, which means that all three of those vectors lie in the same plane. Yeah, Chris? When you're forming the matrix to find the yeah. area, uh -huh. uh, it doesn't matter if you put them in rows or yeah, or columns, right? Correct. All right. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you put the major, whether you put the, the vectors into the rows of the columns. We later talked about that in the context of transposing a matrix. The determinant of a transpose of a matrix is the same as the determinant of the original matrix. So you don't have to worry about whether you're using rows or columns because it's going to be the same volume either way. Okay. Of course, you could get a negative number, and so the area or volume interpretation requires an absolute value of that determinant when you get to that point, but other than that, yeah, you pretty much just go um, calculate that number and you've got your answer. So, so that's, uh, that's, the main, that's the main gist of it. Of course, it's all summarized on the front of the review packet as well. Um, so that's just an overview, kind of what you can expect. Uh, I will probably give a little, uh, little lecture at the beginning of the class period. I will keep it short. I'll keep it simple. I won't be expecting you to... Um, fully engage in everything I'm saying, but I'll keep it very simple, and it won't be related to the exam. It's just a matter of I only have so many class periods to get through the material I need to cover, so I may do that. But I will leave you with uh, an hour, at least an hour and 15 minutes, I would think, uh, to take the test, So, and that should be plenty of time. So The test that's posted as a sample on my website might be slightly long, um, because when I taught the class before, we actually had an even longer class period, if you can imagine that. Uh, so I was able to really you know, give these guys you know, forever to take the test. I won't be able to do that with you guys. I will have to cut you off at when we're out of time, um, because other people have classes to get to and all that kind of thing. So. Any questions about the overview? Before The next thing is we're going to solve a bunch of problems, but are there questions on the overview? 